Hello, companions! Hello. Hello, companions. Uh, well, let's just jump straight into it. Today, we have two special guests. We have the amazing S Simone Bailey. Um, many of you have seen her in Stargate, but she's been in so many other productions in Vancouver and Los Angeles. And then we got my brother here. He is a multi-time Emmy-winning associate director and producer, working on the Baseball World Series, NBA on TNT, and Thursday Night Football on Amazon. And both both of you are my personal guests. Uh, I've been really wanting to do this conversation now for probably two or three years. So thank you so much for, for coming. Yeah. Um, anyway, hello. Hello, both of you. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for having us, for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, and recently, you know, I think what kind of spurred it on um, a couple of weeks ago was that I've had different conversations with each of you. Um, and in those conversations, um, it helped me kind of think about, and then maybe like rethink about, I guess, our roles and responsibilities, uh, as Asians in media or, or maybe not, I don't know. It's something I don't always think about, uh, I guess. Um, first thing though, Simone, thank you so much for <laughs> coming on. Cause you are literally I think you're operating on what two hours of sleep from a night shoot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So as uh, as Murphy's Law would have it, I was on a night shoot last night, and I got home at six thirty a.m. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I That's... have another, I have another night shoot coming up this Thursday. So, to, but that one is even going to be later than, than this one I did. But um, yeah. Uh, Describe to me how you get ready for a night shoot and then think, oh, well, gosh. Me, okay, so I'm <laughs> coming to you live from Vancouver, Canada, and yeah. it's a little rainy here. So uh, being out in a field. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so being out in a field, at, firstly, you have to just guard your safeguard yourself against the elements. So bring yeah. tons of layers. And I mean, wardrobe is really good about that, giving us like hot packs and, and things like that. And there's heaters and people try to really take care of you. But uh, yeah, just staying hydrated and eating comfort food when you can just to get through it. But the director was really nice. Uh, she bought us a coffee, like she brought a coffee truck because sometimes we get food trucks sometimes for certain things. And so they anticipated that people might be a little sleepy and need a little caffeine fix. So uh, we had a coffee truck and I had a lavender white chocolate. Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, like a mocha. Delicious. Yeah. And wow. I was like, ooh, lavender, lavender coffee. I'm digging the lavender these days. Yeah. Frank, I remember you used to do really cold shoots too, right? Was that just more when you were doing like World Series NFL stuff? I remember you had like super heavy coats, like. Um, or is that too long? Well, well, I guess we do work a lot of winter sports, whether it's the uh, the NBA or even late in the in the football American football season. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but most of the time we're we're hanging out in a studio truck, like a broadcasting truck. So um, yeah, though although in those trucks, I will say it is quite cold because uh, they need to keep the temperatures down for the equipment. Um, so even, you know, I've done shows in, you know, the dead of summer in Las Vegas, but you still got to bring your coat with you for inside the truck. Um, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> it'll be 100 degrees outside, but uh, like 50 degrees inside. So. Wow. Okay. Well, now that we've talked about the, oh, you're, and you're coming from Denver, right? So. Yeah, I'm in Denver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. I've never been. <laughs> I've never been either. And I'm assuming once Franklin moves soon, I will also not visit there again. So there you go. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, back onto the subject. Okay. Elevating Asians in media. The thing that I 
was thinking about actually is I don't think about it very often, I guess, and, until someone kind of brings it up with me. Hmm. Um, I don't know. It's not really a thing, I guess. Um, and then sometimes you see other Asians maybe on set or on crew or something. And all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, you kind of, you know, chat to them. Do you, do you, do you either of you ever think about that? I don't know. Maybe we can start with Simone. Is, is that something that ever comes up or, um, or in like kind of situ certain situations for you? It does come up for me a lot in various ways. So firstly, um, just so the audience knows, I'm half Chinese. My mom is full Chinese, born in China, uh, raised in Canada. And my mom even says that I'm more Chinese than she is, meaning that I just embrace the culture. I mean, I don't speak fluent, but I know smatterings of a bit of Mandarin, a bit of Cantonese. Uh, my mom is from Toisan, which is a village in Canton, China. So she's got her own. I mean, there's so many dialects, right? Um, so I know little things here and there. And uh, But often when people see me visually, they wouldn't necessarily know that I'm Chinese at all. And I've been told I look like, you know, various races or white or, you know, whatever. Um, but as you can imagine, half of my family is Chinese. And so there are Chinese customs and I celebrate Chinese New Year every year. And I love to go eat dim sum and go, go have Chinese food, not on the regular, but I mean, that's part of, um, you know, all, there's part of of my tradition and, and lifestyle. And, uh, and that's my family. There's a lot of history there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we can talk about that a little bit more, I think that kind of expands on the conversation that we've had, you know, pretty recently where, um, you know, previously 10, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. um, we just didn't have as many opportunities, um, on screen in front of camera, and I think you mentioned like, you know, your your look isn't, um, you know, traditionally 100 percent full Chinese. And in the 90s, there was that kind of um, I don't know if the right word is exotic kind of look, but, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, over really maybe the last eight years, 10 years, you started getting many more kind of Asians on screen, but then you're sort of coming into a little bit of an issue as well now where it's almost like you don't look Chinese enough. And yeah, um, yeah I don't know if you can kind of describe uh, kind of stories from both sides of like, you know, what kind of what was that like? And what is it, what is it like for you, I guess, now when you're going for auditions and, and you know, in that kind of environment? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a, it's a big umbrella that that question. But mm. I, um, I've gone through ups and downs with it because sometimes there is a bit of an identity crisis because I don't uh, visually perhaps look Chinese, um, but I, you know, I am half. <laughs> um, but in the way of casting, I think when I first started on the scene, um, it was a different landscape. There were a lot, of, it was more like they wanted the blonde bombshell. And I used to wish my name was Susan. And I used to like, you know, just kind of want to be a little more white because that was what was happening. Um, and then as the years went on, um, there was kind of a swing to more ethnically ambiguous. And a lot of sci-fi shows uh, were very open about having, um, ethnically ambiguous, exotic looking people, which was great. Um, and so then I started on shows like Stargate and Battlestar, things like that. Um, yeah, and it- and By the way, on that- here too, because, yeah. what's that? I was just saying, like, in addition to that, what I actually liked about that style of casting is, yeah. you know, as we move into the future, I get that Stargate is, is present day, but- yeah other kind of sci-fi shows, you know, as the world becomes more and more integrated mm -hmm. um, and people <laughs> cross-pollinate. Yeah, they would cross-pollinate. <laughs> yeah. You know, we start totally. to become this beautiful mix, this beautiful hybrid of cultures and, you know, true melting pot. And so mm -hmm. that's one thing that um, 
yeah, to be honest, I've, I really appreciated about um, mixed race and mixed race faces in, in media because um, that's sort of like a glimpse into the future in a way that is sci-fi, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, and like growing up, it was, it was hard to see a lot of people because like the representation uh, wasn't really there. So it would be once in a while, you'd be like, oh, there's, there's one. Yeah. Oh, there's one. Oh, great. Oh, there's, you know, Connie Chung in the news or, you know, so-and-so oh, there. Oh, Connie or, Chung. Yeah, she well, was huge. I mean, it's just, you know, they'd give you um, hope that yeah. that anyone could do it and that, um, that, that visibility mattered and that mm -hmm. it was validated, you know, and we needed to see those, those kinds of uh, people for, for representation. You know, because our uh, the perception of ourselves changes when we see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, Frank. How about you? Do you do you like ever think about yourself as like a Chinese person or an Asian in media, or is it just when I WhatsApp you about this, you go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I I definitely do, um, and quite a bit actually. Uh, I'll say like probably when I first started getting. Um, when I first started in this industry at, at Fox, uh, I was in LA. Um, my supervisor was Asian. Uh, I had coworkers that were Asian. So I kind of didn't think about it as much. Also went to a pretty diverse school, uh, university at Northwestern. Um, Lawrence and I grew up in Irvine, California, which um, mm. has a huge Asian population. Um, so growing up, I didn't think about it as much but then when I moved to Atlanta um, about 10, 12 years ago, um, the Asian rate just completely dropped out. Um, and that's when I started realizing it a lot more, noticing a lot more. Um, and then even now to this point. But yeah, no, every time, like, especially I started freelancing a couple of years ago, as opposed to being on staff. And um, I'm kind of jumping into new crews a lot more often rather than kind of sticking with the same ones. Every single time I'd start on one, you can just like subconsciously, you kind of like pick out like, Oh, who's who, I mean, even at this point, like doing a lot of hockey where we're most, mostly when they're working as a white man. So you're kind of just picking out like, are there any minorities? Are there any women? Like, <laughs> and it's not something you're consciously doing. It's just something that's going on in the background. Mm -hmm. But, um, Definitely, definitely, it is top of mind constantly. Well, so three years ago, we had this conversation uh, on the companion, and I think Shang Chi had just like come out, uh, like we probably spoke on a Saturday, and Shang Chi had come out on a Thursday, and I remember, you know, we were discussing how, you know, you sort of had to like take that stereotype on the chin, potentially, you know, like if you're an Asian guy you're sort of like the model minority or like the, the, the hard worker, you know, um, the silent stoic kind of type. These are kind of Asian stereotypes, I guess, in, in yeah. the media. And if you're a woman, you might be like the dragon lady, mysterious, but deadly um, or submissive, you know? And I remember our conversation then Franklin was like, do we, do we like, ex like, it's not, it's not great, but at least there's an opportunity for us. And then there, at least we're on screen. And it was like a kind of an internal struggle of, um, you know, at least um, at least we get a chance. I guess we get a chance to maybe put in like one kind of small thing in there. And um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess. So, yeah. And that was the conversation that, that Franklin and I had. And I guess, Simone, for you, um, I don't know. I'm sure it's even more challenging because it's so visible for you. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Well, I think when when that movie came out, it was like, "Whoa, we got our first Marvel yeah, movie!" Yeah. You know, and that was a big deal because if you look at Black Panther, that really put the metrics on the map because it was like not only was that so well received for the community and people in general, but the money showed right it showed the box office or the box office showed the studios okay this is this is a viable product for 
for the masses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the masses, right? it was blockbuster. And, you know, if you think about how the merch blew up and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it's it's a really big deal. And, um, you know, all those films that we've seen, like Crazy Rich Asians and, um, you know, even Always Be My Maybe, but other ones, you know, like, well, but that Marvel movie, they make so much money. And then, and then that will help perpetuate um, the representation, I think. You yeah, know? yeah. But yeah. definitely, um, yeah, when I started the biz, um, speaking of, of Asian stereotypes, I mean, it. I didn't necessarily get Asian stereotypes personally because probably because I'm more white leaning in my look, um, but I did definitely get female stereotypes, like a lot of mm. like prostitute and receptionist and, you know, things like that, right? Mm. And I've seen an evolution there in the roles now that I get. It's a little more like tough boss, you know, badass girl, right? But um, I definitely had colleagues that were very visibly, you know, Chinese, Vietnamese, uh, East Indian or South Asian. And they were constantly battling with like, okay, I'm going out for a cab driver. I'm the convenience store guy. They want me to do it in an accent, you know, stuff like that. And it would be a real internal struggle, struggle for those actors to feel like they had to like, you know, dance monkey dance. Uh, for something that didn't really align with their dreams of of the Hollywood dream for them, right? So you would see uh, different actors react differently. Some people would be like, "You want me to jump? How high? I will do the accent. I will, you know, wear the, you know, traditional garb. Whatever you need to do, so I, you know, whatever I need to do to get the the job." So there was that camp of people. There was another camp of people that were. Um, and even like I have a black friend who refuses to do the thug thing. So he would always present himself with glasses, a suit. He would all of his photos, his headshots were very professional and he carried himself a certain way. I have another friend who is South Asian and, you know, he would constantly get asked or to do. Well, firstly, he'd go into the audition and even if they wanted an accent, he would go in and just do it straight in a standard American accent, uh, you know, just regular voice. Mm -hmm. And the casting would go, um, do you mind just doing it in an accent? And he goes, yeah, no problem. And then he'd do an English accent. And he yeah, just like, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, is that what you want? You know, and uh, <laughs> so, and of course she'd be like, thanks. Yeah. And you know, like disappointment, right? Because he didn't do what they wanted to do. But I can see how people want to fight those stereotypes and take the power back as an actor instead of just taking it and being like, oh, I'm just going to be part of the stereotype machine, right? Yeah. I mean, did you get a it chance to... People. Yeah. Did you get a chance to watch American fiction? The No, the... I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. Okay. No. Because... um. You know, it won Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, but uh -huh. it's interesting. Uh, Franklin and I briefly have talked about it, but I don't think we've talked about it in depth. It highlighted this issue for Black culture and media where, you know, the writer um, mm -hmm. is, is writing novels that um, don't necessarily have that kind of stereotype. Um, and he's seeing other Black authors um, just becoming much more successful for writing kind of a... Um, almost like a, a pandering patronizing, I guess, kind of style of black character. And um, I guess the, the question really is, it's like, you know, how do you balance the responsibility of maybe accurately representing yourself and your beliefs mm -hmm. and the culture, but also needing to appeal to a broad audience. And so in that movie, he has to struggle with, should I write for a much more like liberal white um, audience that really like almost like lives up to the, the hard times of, you yeah. know, African Americans yeah. and in, you know, kind of turning that conversation, I guess to us, it's um yeah. Like, do you, do you help, I guess, the narrative and the stereotype a little bit. So it's a bit more digestible when people can almost, you know, 
grab onto it and then and then i don't know like almost from the back door be able to tell a little yeah. bit more of an asian story um yeah. this is me brainstorming now like well I... it's interesting so like in the dj world right yeah djs are like do i play what they want or do i play right. <laughs> what i think they need right so there's that aspect um yeah i mean obviously you have to consider what would make things more palatable for people but i don't think we should necessarily compromise ourselves whore ourselves you know yeah. what i mean like feel um what is it oh, the words escape me um to our sleep but yeah <laughs> i i think it's it's a delicate balance and i think it's yeah. easy case and it's project to project or whatever it is. But um, I think in anything in life that you always want to maintain integrity and find a, a happy medium. Yeah. 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 What about, what about you, Frank? Because you're behind the camera, right? And you work in sports, like American sports, where other than baseball, really, there's there's not too many huge superstars, right? That are Asian, um, you were a graphics producer with a lot of power. Do you do you do you throw an extra Asian graphic in there every once in a while? <laughs> um, I mean, I definitely, yeah. Wherever we can highlight, uh, we will. Um, but uh, yeah, this is. Um, I do think there is some kind of benefit to try and easing people in. Um, this is a really random example that I just thought of, but. Um, and it has nothing to do with what I do as work. <laughs> but uh, I went out with a bunch of crewmates uh, during the season uh, this past fall. And, um, you know, I wanted to get some Asian food, so we were down for it. Um, so we first, uh, we decided to go to Din Tai Fung uh, in L.A. And it was, uh, or actually the one in Vegas. But anyway, it was great. It was wonderful. Everyone loved it. It was very nice. Um, and Very like, nice. Oh, yeah, we, we should do this again next week. It's like, yeah, yeah, of course. So we we're in LA. Um, and I saw that nearby there was a Heidi Lau. Yeah. So I was like, okay, why don't we try this uh Heidi Lau? It's what is a hot pot place if you guys have heard of it. Um yeah, so well, I guess to set it up for if people don't know, so Ding Tai Fong is like dim sum. Uh, I think it's like one of the only Michelin star dim sums that came out of Taiwan. So Dumplings, um, yeah, soup yeah. dumplings is kind of dumplings like, primarily what you're getting. So I think people are probably a little bit more used to it in general, right? Like a Western mm. kind of a person. If um, but Heidi Lao is a hot pot place, and if you don't know what hot pot is, it's like you know a giant <laughs> um, pot of absolutely boiling water. You get a lot of raw meats and vegetables, and you kind of have to cook it live yourself, and so. I think probably for Franklin and myself and Simone, you know, like it's normal. Yeah, we kind of grew up with it. You, we, know. you grew up with it, but you, but yeah, we probably will forget that not everyone has grown up with something like that. So anyway, continue the story. But I just want to give reference <laughs> yeah. to what Heidi Lau and D Time Phone is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I did kind of just throw those two like random references. <laughs> right, right. Uh, <laughs> willy nilly out there. Of course, but, everyone knows what that is. Yeah, everyone knows. You yeah, should know. Everyone yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, we went to the Heidi Lau and like instantly I realized we may be in over our heads here a little bit. <laughs> like there was a lot more wrangling that had to happen. Um, they still enjoyed it and it was great, but there was a degree of like, if we would have started with Heidi Lau, we maybe would have never gone to Din Tai Fung the following right. week. Cause they would be like, oh, okay, that was, that was aggressive, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there is a, cause with anything, you know, jumping into the deep end, uh, uh, one way or another culturally, it's, it's a lot. I mean, if you didn't grow up with this stuff, um, like if I'm going to take someone to Taiwan, like the first thing I'm going, I'm, I'm not going to introduce stinky tofu to them. It's like, Hey, you should try this at a, at a, at a night market. Um, cause I understand that growing up with it, like you're able to build up, you know, you're kind of able to try a lot of things and, uh, work your way up there but um yeah it, it is there is something to 
trying to kind of ease people into it um because they they do want to learn and they'll they'll end up enjoying it uh, at the end um but it could just you know could be a little aggressive in the beginning <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> simone have you been to heidi lao no oh i'm gonna have to take you to heidi lao next time we oh, meet yeah, up please. Oh, there's yeah, one in yeah. seattle you're ready to go uh, now i'm just yeah, like yeah. Yeah. i just love the word dumpling really Oh, next time you're back in the UK, you mm -hmm. just you just book and a couple of days either before or after. You let me know in advance, oh, yeah. and then I will take you on a London tour that has both Ding Tai Fung and also Heidi Lau. We can yeah, we can do the noodle dance together. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> okay. We'll do that. Awesome. Well, I like the conversation around easing in. Um, you know, we previously like had a like films like um like moana where it introduces polynesian culture as an example uh, but there was a little bit of backlash because it was very much so like a melding you know pot of like multiple polynesian cultures and um are we at the stage i guess where like i guess what stage are we in where we're still introducing people in media and maybe we're at that kind of Moana stage still, or are we starting to get into finer, you know, and finer different types of media, television, film, like like K dramas, Korean dramas are becoming increasing popular. Mm -hmm. um, anime has always been pretty popular, I, I think, you know, and and it's starting to become uh, almost like mass populist, po you know, popular in popularity. Um, yeah, where do you guys feel like we're at in terms of this in, in stage in terms of um, Asian as a homogenous group or or these kind of like specific cultures? Um, I don't know. Simone, do you want to start if you have any thoughts? On that? Um, it's interesting. I mean, this topic is delicate, um, yeah. big. Um, I think the landscape is always changing. I think... Um, we in most recent years have become increasing increasingly um aware the value of employing people that are on the project in the on the ground floor meaning the writers the creative like the key creatives let's just say the directors the producers writers you know lead cast etc uh, being that um, ethnicity and being as authentic as possible so that the material can be more uh, detailed, nuanced, and authentic, right? I think authentic is, is in now. Yeah, yeah. In a big way. Um, in some ways almost overcorrected, but uh, again, it's a slow moving ship. And I think we are in a more positive direction than a negative direction. Um, I love, I mean, obviously I love seeing representation and it absolutely matters. Um, I can understand some studios, like when you're dealing with an animated movie, I can see why they would maybe water down some things and make it a little more palatable for young audiences or people that uh, are a wider range. Um, and I think, you know, again, it, it comes down to metrics for the uh, studios when they're like, okay, you know, this isn't just for a uh, an American audience, this is for this country and this country and this country, you know, and they're thinking about the global uh, scope and span of that project. Um, but I, I do think it's going to be really interesting because there will be a point where all of these new babies and kids will grow up and they're growing up in this world with that visibility and that reputation or representation rather on the rise and so it'll be cool to see where things go for everyone yeah i feel like there's something at least, about that later. yeah yeah <laughs> no but I, I feel like from my perspective i feel like 
I don't know if this is actually accurate or not. Um, I'm not like a film historian or anything, mm. but it felt like very, very slow progress, you know, from like the 1800s to like, like genuinely like, I don't know, 2015 or something where Asians and media, it was almost like, it's very spotty and it was quite homogenous. And then somehow a combination of like the pandemic, Squid Game, Par Parasite probably winning the Oscar, right? Yeah. And then yeah. like Squid Game and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, subs, not dubs, you know, like that whole thing. Um, so that means subtitles, not dubbing. Um, mm. Everywhere. I've never heard everywhere. that before. That's cool. Subs, oh, yeah. Not subs, dubs. not dubs. Yeah. Yeah. Like, subs, not dubs. You know, like everyone's yeah. cheering. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if you were in the subs, not dubs kind of movement, you're literally listening to Korean, you know? Yeah. And you start to hear, I, hopefully, like, oh, this is different than, say, Shang-Chi, which came out that same year. And the first, like, what, 10, 15 minutes is like, we're just going Mandarin. And like, buckle up, you better, you better read the tiny box or don't understand, but we're doing it. And like, so I guess what I mean is it felt like almost we fast tracked. I don't know if that's fair or not, but hmm. um, I think some of the other kind of, whether it's gender, LGBTQ, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like neurodiversities, neurodiversity, it's like yeah. such a big umbrella. And somehow yeah. we were able to almost like, I don't think we did anything. But we're in a situation now where there is a little bit more nuance at times. Like, yeah. like we almost like jumped the line or like we we evolved too quickly in that side. I don't, well, I don't know if it's evolved too quickly. I don't know exactly what I'm like. I don't have a point. I think what I'm observing, though, is like, oh, wow, sometimes it's this Asian thing. And sometimes it's very specific, like Korean, Japanese, um, the Disney Plus show, American born Chinese. It wasn't even like Chinese. It's like American born Chinese. And then like Franklin and I would be able to get these references because we're both American born Chinese. I mean, like literally even the ABC acronym is, is describing, you know, us. Um, anyway, I just said a bunch of stuff. I, I don't know. I, I didn't have a point, but I guess that like, are we fast? Have we fast tracked or what happened um, in the, I don't know. Frank moving fast. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. yeah. I do. I do agree with uh, to this to the extent for, for sure. Um, I feel like a big part of it was um, like streaming in general. Mm -hmm. Like once that started coming around, once internet, YouTube, like all that started getting more powerful, um, especially with younger viewers, like they're able to see things that was essentially like put through a filter for us growing up. Like they can go specifically to what they're looking for now and see all these different types of media and access to international media and different cultures is so much easier now than it was before uh yeah. when you know we we're limited to cable or whatnot um so yeah i mean i i i think um with streamers like netflix especially you know like just to come to mind for a few things like you're able to have these thumbnails come up it's like yeah sure i'll, I'll give that a shot you know and I like squid game and then once you start seeing it more and more, then they'll start putting on shows that have more representation and things like that. Yeah. Um, anime is, is like another great example. Uh, people are, it's a lot easier to find that stuff now. And um, yeah, it's, I, I think there's, there's been a pretty big push over the last like 10 years or so. Uh, now that access has been a lot easier and especially with younger audiences. I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Simone. No, 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 no. Well, I was gonna say, even reality TV, the fact that the show uh, Bling Empire, oh, yeah, right? yeah, and so you're watching a bunch of very wealthy, uh, cool Asian people <laughs> just like tear up LA or you know travel the world, and they, you know they've got all this stuff. Bling, bling, bling. Um, it definitely makes them cool, you know. Yeah. For the most part, right? Mm -hmm. You're seeing a hot DJ, you're seeing all these people with, you know, billions of dollars, et cetera. Shopping. I personally like that because, you know, like, growing up. I mean, it's cool to see, like, yeah. to see a window into that, right? It's like American Asians. Yeah. We could be both good at math and also ripped. That's 
That's how that's the new fairy <laughs> yeah. I'm putting out there. And be an ambassador for Gucci, you know, or whatever. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um one one thing, um, Simone, I think you were well, I mean, you literally said the words like why representation matters. And yeah. um when I was um, you know, kind of thinking about the subject a couple of years ago, um Franklin's wife and I were having a conversation about women in film. And she was just saying how, oh, you could just tell like when a woman writes a script versus a, a guy writing a script for women. And I was like, how could you just tell? Like, what is it about it? Um, mm. She's like, I don't know. You could just tell. That was the conversation. And I don't think I really understood what she meant. I think I knew intellectually what it meant like you should hire diverse writers and directors and crews and you you kind of get it but I, for some reason i don't know i i didn't really feel it or i didn't i guess i couldn't experience it um and then i recently watched beef <laughs> and ali wong <laughs> yeah but i don't think it even need to be asians right it just happened to be created by asians directed by asians starring asians yeah. And it was the first time where it wasn't even just like Asians uh, were the stars. It was um it was very local to Southern California. And it yeah. was saying things and doing things. I don't know, Frank, if you picked this up, like where it was talking about like, oh, he went to UCI. And it was like, like a little <laughs> eye roll. Yeah. Like, and then I'm like, oh, I got you. Of course they're gonna have a Korean church, and of course they're gonna play basketball. And I know that guy. I know what this yeah. guy's gonna do. Of course, he's going to get super angry and like kick the ball and just go like total, like, you know, it, it was it, it was interesting. And I was like, oh, I could tell this is written by an Asian person or directed by an Asian person. And that was the first time that it ever, I guess, like really happened with me. Because I, I think with something like Crazy Rich Asians or, or Shang-Chi, it was like it was overt. I appreciated it. I appreciated taking the shoes off before you go into a, you know, into the house you call everyone auntie and uncle, but beef, they didn't have to do that. And yet you could just tell, um, am I getting that right? And Simone, is that, do you see that both in, you know, being female and seeing, you know, whether it's a female, not maybe, you know, or don't know it's a female writer, but you, you could just tell. I, it's hard because I'm, I'm kind of of the mind where, it's not that we can always tell. It's like sometimes I can tell, but mm -hmm. not always. And I and I don't want to say that you can always tell when it's a female director. You can always tell when it's a white writer doing something that's, you know, ethnic. Like, I also want to give credit to people that, because everyone nowadays could come from very, very different, very unique backgrounds. And they could have immigrated from here and then they were raised in this country and then they moved to this country. So, you know, it's like, I know white guys that speak fluent Chinese and you're just like, what? Like, you know, like, yeah, things yeah, like that. Totally. So, you know, and, and you don't know their backstory. You don't know that, that they spent years and years in, you know, in Beijing or whatever it is. Right. So I don't like to, put blanket like statements on things, you know, cause I think it is case by case and very uh, unique and nuanced. Right. Right. But, um, I will say sometimes you can tell. <laughs> yeah, Definitely, yeah. Um, I think it's wonderful when we can have those diverse um, authentic voices yeah. that are experienced and they can drop those kind of wink winks like the, the college or the, the church or the whatever, those kind of specifics are really nice. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. even know. Cause I, cause I'm not, yeah. I don't think what I was really trying to say is um you should always hire for diversity or anything. I think what it was is that I don't even think the UC Irvine Korean church thing is a wink wink. I think it was like natural for that to happen. It would be, it would have been weird. Well, if specificity, it was a, city, right? We're talking yeah. About it would have been weird if it was a Chinese yeah. church and they were playing football. I would, I probably still watch it, but it would it wouldn't resonate with me, and and mm -hmm. I, I usually don't think about that. It was mm -hmm. just a happened to like continue to unfold, and I'm like, oh yeah, I see what they're doing. Oh yeah, 
Of course they would do. It, it was like any other kind of sport would have been weird. Um, mm. A different scenario, I think, could have would have been weird. So anyway, yeah, it, it's it's yeah. I guess it go, just goes to authenticity of, oh, all of it makes sense. It, it wasn't like you could go on Wikipedia and piece it together and go, okay, this is like the authentic experience. It was like, mm -hmm. um, it just felt really natural for me. And and then some. Yeah. And I was watching it, going, oh, I really hope like Rebecca and Tommy on the team. Like they never lived in Southern California. Like I don't even know if they've been to Southern California. Yeah. They're gonna lose out on all these like little references that like I'm finding so much joy in because it's like, I, oh, I totally kind of, I know that person. It, it's, it's interesting how they, they did that. Well, and I think that's the place where we want to graduate to is where those kinds of things are seamless. Like for instance, you were saying with the TV series beef, we're watching Ali Wong and, and the cast just go through this story that is cast with predominantly Asians. Yeah. And but we're not necessarily being like making it all, you know, yeah, I know you typical. Mean. It's yeah. just life, man. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's great. And that's so refreshing. And I think, you know, we'll hopefully see more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Frank, on beef and I guess stories that could or cannot well, I don't know what the right question to ask is. But. Yeah, no, I I kind of know what you're saying though, and and I agree with you, Simone. Like we, that is what we're aiming for. Like we're we're not definitely needing the specific like wink wink nod nods, but it yeah. is the stuff that's subconscious that kind of it kind of like builds out the world in a really natural way. Yeah. And, um, it's kind of like when you're like when you're making a dish and you're cooking, like it's not like, oh, I need to like taste this like spice, but it's just, oh, it tastes better because everything's like blending together uh, better and er everything seems to fit better and things like that. Very well said. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. So, so, some weird madness happening outside my window. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> they're, they're not happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, no, thank you for, for entertaining that discussion, that part of the discussion for me. Cause it was, it was, it was definitely an eye opening moment for me. Like, whoa, this is, it's all happening. And I think I, I think I was getting what Leslie Ann was saying where she could just tell like the authenticity, I guess, of a script. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and conversely, it's just so cringe when we see it go the other way. And you're just like, okay, here comes the so and so, and now we're putting, you know, this box tick and this da da da, and like, oh, we're gonna hit them with this, you know. And you're just like, yeah, I see, I see what you're doing. You you did it. You ticked the boxes, but it's just like tokenism. It's yeah, not really yeah. like authentic, you know. You're just doing your job, you know. Yeah. Well, kind of speaking beyond just the writers and the directors but even you know producers crew members things like that so frank you were saying in la there were a lot more asian crew members that you would work with is that right and like so is it like a very regional thing or have you actually seen like growth and like asians in sports media because to be honest the only other asian i've ever seen this is kind of weird actually thinking about it mm. um in kind of like professional sports media it's like probably matt uh, he's like a friend of ours. I grew up with also Chinese that Franklin uh, helped get a job at Fox. But I, I don't remember my perspective as well. Really weird in, in Britain here, being an executive producer out here. Um, kind of going to the first question. I don't actually think about being an Asian in media. And I remember going to um, BBC Showcase. That's like their equivalent of MIP. So if anyone... Um, uh, or upfronts like so if anyone doesn't know like usually you make a bunch of tv shows and there's like really big kind of conferences where the whole world comes you know the the buyers from romania and you know australia they all come to try to like buy and sell their kind of tv shows and um and the bbc is so big it's able to have its own um so they don't need to like bring everyone in so mm -hmm. um so it's called BBC Showcase. And I remember I was there and on one side, it's like the $7 million party or something from what I understand. It's so big. And on one side, it's all of the buyers, like 700 buyers from around the world. 
And then there's like this really big stage in the middle. And on the right hand side, it's like all the different producers. And my producing partner, at the time he turned to me and he said, dude, you're the only Asian person, like person <laughs> on the producing side. And I, I never, I just never realized that. And I looked around, I was like, oh, you're right, I am. And so I think back actually in, in, in here in the UK, I, I obviously don't know everyone, but I don't think I've ever met another Chinese, Japanese, Korean executive producer, I guess, before. Mm -hmm. Um, at least at least not within the kind of BBC uh, worldwide side of things. I'm, I'm sure there are, and I'm sure there are Asians that work there. But anyway, going that you know to that, it, it's it's interesting that that happened. And um, yeah, it was interesting, frankly, that you said, oh, you've actually spoken to work with other Asians. And then once you kind of moved to Atlanta and then now kind of doing, um, yeah, freelance out of Denver, um, it's it's a lot fewer and far between. Like, is there... I don't know. Do you feel like there's like a shift where more and more Asians are kind of taking on media roles or, um, um, where is it still kind of sparse, I guess? Um, it's tough to tell. I, I think it is a regional thing. Like you were mentioning, um, like Atlanta has a really big black community. So there, although there weren't a lot of Asians there, there were a lot more black people working on the cruise as opposed to at Fox where there might've been more Asians. Um, cause naturally you'll kind of get a lot of the people that are locally there to get, to be part of the cruise. Um, they'll be more conscious of the broadcasts that are going on locally. So then they'll go after those ones. Um, so I, I think a lot of it does come regionally. Um, and then now that I'm working like back with sort of an LA crew with Thursday night football, um, producers, Indian, uh, we have women on the crew also. Um, so that is more of a diverse crew also. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure in terms of like a numerical trend or whatnot, but, uh, I, I think in general, seeing more and more people doing it, um, we'll have, you know, younger people of color, uh, going out for these positions too. Mm. Yeah. How, how about like kind of in the scripted space, Simone, is it? Uh... I mean, I'm very active here in Vancouver. I, uh, we have the Vancouver Chinese Film Festival, um, an Asian film festival. We have the Mighty Movie uh, or Mighty Asian Movie Marathon. So we have all of these like um, festivals here, and there are because the the population here is uh, very Asian leaning. Um, so we do have a lot of creatives in all different capacities here. It's lovely. Even the set I was on last night, you see a lot of Asian people in various positions. Um, and uh, it's it's cool to see. Definitely seeing more and more. And also even women, right? In women as mm -hmm. grips, as, you know, things where, you know, normally they wouldn't think that women could physically hold their own weight in certain positions, but now you're seeing like people that are kicking ass. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's really cool to see. And it I, is I really love, cool. I love yeah. that we promote that. And I love that even um, streaming services like Netflix had incentives like that, like various BIPOC incent incentives, things like that. Um, it's interesting to me, someone brought this up the other day. Uh, one of my Chinese friends said to me, he goes, you know, the word BIPOC kind of bothers me. I said, why? He goes, because it's black, indigenous, people of color. And he goes, mm -hmm. don't you think it should just be people of color? <laughs> yeah. Like, why do you have to, like, prioritize, like, that, that, Da, 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 and the and the rest of them, you know what I mean? Like, and I was like, oh, I never thought of that, but that's really interesting, you know. How yeah. how do you take yeah? Because I I I feel like I've gone on this really big journey of like not knowing or not thinking about being a minority. Like literally growing up in Irvine, like what Franklin was saying is like the the population in Irvine is so Asian. When you looked at the kind of ethnicity breakdown, I think. Yeah. If you just were to have Asian as a category, typically, and you might have like, you know, white and black, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, I think it would be something like 70 to 75% of the pie chart. Like that's how, how it, how big it was that they had to, I remember 
break it down like 33% Chinese, 27% Japanese, 12% Korean. It was like it, they had to break it down to, to those kind of um, groups. And um, so going on that kind of journey and then, you know, kind of you're in my 20s and 30s, like being really sensitive to it. And now kind of mellowing again, like, yeah, okay, I guess we're POC and sometimes we're that, sometimes we're BIPOC, sometimes we're Asian. I don't know, I've kind of, I don't know if I'm mellowed. Yeah, like, I guess, um, I guess it's this like, thing of, you know, I guess it's the conversation I've been trying to uh, bring up this whole time, right? Like, are we Asians? Are we Chinese right now? What like, are we? What exactly are, are we right we? now? What's the situation? Oh, gotcha. Okay, we're in Irvine. Who am I? Forget the Asian thing for a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. How do you feel about that, Frank? I know you're in the past, like you've been much more, you know, vocal of, of you know, different kind of Asian rights and specific cultural ethnic rights as well. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I guess just how do you see that and feel? Yeah, it's, um, it, there's definitely like an ebb and flow and, you know, it's, there's never one kind of specific way you're feeling about it. Um, obviously with the, when the pandemic happened and Asian hate was spiking and all that, it, you know, a lot of these feelings and emotions were top of mind. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, in general, I would say, I don't know, it, it is something you definitely think about constantly or, or i'll think about constantly um but it's not the only thing and there's it, it is a delicate kind of balancing act of um of uh, of like what you're trying to do and put forward always so it's i don't know it's it's tough to say <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah 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 it's all right we, we don't have to solve it in this hour <laughs> challenging <laughs> I, I hope it's also with other, um, you know, people here, it's, it's not just an ethnic, you know, a race thing of Asians, right? There's people feel identity in so many different ways. And so, yeah. you know, hopefully as part of this conversation too, it is complex and it's, it is new, yeah. nuanced and, yeah. um, but it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, are there any other kind of topics, I guess, around Asians and media that, and it came kind of sprang to mind. I have a few other questions, but I wanted to mm -hmm. make sure we wrapped up everything we we can kind of on uh, these these parts of the conversation. Yeah, I will say this. Um, much like a lot of the Western world, like for the most part that are not identifying as Middle Eastern, may find Middle Eastern people and culture and religion as very like, whoa, like other, foreign, right? I think the more we see any representation of any people, faith, et cetera, it brings all of the whole world a little more closer together perhaps a little more compassionate and understanding. Um, and again, hopefully we uh, elevate to the point where all of that stuff, it, it doesn't matter in the way that it matters, like in a bad way, right? If that makes sense. That we graduate to a level where um, we can all get along and we can all understand and, yeah. and we, we, uh, appreciate everybody's cultures and backgrounds yeah. yeah i think you know to kind of piggyback on that is what i love about seeing a diversity of any kind doesn't ha it doesn't have to be ethnic um but i'll probably i'll use an ethnic example it it at least for me piques curiosity and interest um so i'm almost kind of ashamed to say this like so I, I lived in India for a little while, oh. uh, like significant time, a little while, not like three months, a little while. Uh, I started a Bollywood fashion company out there. And, and so like, I'm in literally entrenched in Indian culture. Um, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a joke. Anyway, bad joke. It was wild. Okay, it was wild. Um, 
And I didn't know the, I mean, I knew there were tension and I knew the high level of, of politics, I suppose, of India and Pakistan. Mm. Um, and sadly, I kind of only knew it through the lens of um, cricket. Like the India Pakistan cricket game match is like the thing you have to watch, and it's a country, you know, national pride. Th this whole thing, and the thing I was uh, uh, kind of getting to that I'm embarrassed to say is, I didn't really know much about it, and it wasn't until um, Miss Marvel, um, you know, the kind of uh, more teenage MCU um, series, uh, we were watching it. And and Sarah, my wife, was like asking me, like, oh, do you know about this? And it's like, I didn't. And <laughs> that series what, is what actually got me researching and reading and just learning about, you know, that that history of weirdly I was immersed in, but didn't understand or or know or wasn't educated about. Yeah. Um, and like I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah. Because had Miss Marvel not come out, I wouldn't have looked into it in, in that way and, and understand it. So, um, yeah, it, anyway, I really appreciated that show, uh, for like a very different reason, that mm -hmm. personal reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, Franklin, are there any, any kind of last thoughts on, on representation on screen? Um, just uh, echoing a lot of what you guys both have been saying. Um, I think we all, you know, kind of appreciate the impact of it, um, see the benefits of it. Um, we all like learning new things. I mean, people in general are are curious. Like human beings are curious. They like learning. They like experiencing different things. Um, and the best way to do that is uh, is you know immersing yourself in it, having people with different experiences, um, being a part of it. Um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I've got a kind of a fun, a couple of fun questions to kind of ask about this, right? Which is, um, we talked about this one one potential way to help um, ease audiences in or introduce audiences in um, into different cultures, Asian culture is maybe some kind of cultural mashup, and that that oftentimes is quite fun. Um, so, uh, so I don't I don't know if you can think on the spot. <laughs> okay, this might be a terrible question, which is. Imagine blending a traditional Asian story or Chinese story um, and another drastically different genre. Um, what would that look like? What would you want to see? And and I'll start. Does that does that kind of make sense? Like American born Chinese kind of had that, you know, where it was set in American school, but it took a very, you know, historical classic Chinese um, story, uh, Journey to the West, right? And kind of mashed those kind of two things in. So one um, story that I've always um, really wanted to see, but I think Western audiences then would really love um, mm -hmm. is, oh man, I don't even know the English lang like name. Is um, in Chinese, it's Sui Hu Zuan. Oh, what's that? What is it called in English? Oh, I don't know. But basically it's about... <laughs> I'm well, looking I'm to here. Franklin to translate. Yeah. Sounds, like a, also, sounds like a terrible story. I <laughs> <Yeah>. don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about with Say Who's Ben? Or it's I don't actually, that, that title sounds familiar, but I don't remember what the, like, the tale is. Uh, it's effectively like a battle against good and evil, and there are demons. Um, uh, demons is the wrong way to describe it because uh, all demons are good or bad, like however you want to describe it. But there's like a bunch of them like, in the heavens and there's a bunch of them in hell, but heaven and hell are not necessarily good or evil. And that, but they effectively have to um, fight against evil together. Um, and, but it's the kind of thing that I can imagine, Oh, it's very games of throny. I, I think there's like, there's, there's probably ways to be able to, um, yeah. Bring that kind of epic Lord of the Rings style uh, with effectively an Asian story. That is one of the, you know, old, thousands of year old stories that um um uh yeah that's anyway, interesting uh, that's my uh, that's my thing yeah so yeah. warner brothers you know it's got an extra 200 mil um yeah. and you know you want to you want to do an epic um 
I don't even know the English name. That's how authentic it is. I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> hmm. um, yeah. Why well, can't I remember what it's called? It is called um, Water Margin. <laughs> In English, Water Margin. Okay. Um, yeah, from the Ming Dynasty. Hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Do you guys have anything like that? You ever th thought, you know, this classic story? We got to see this on on screen. Well, since you posed the question, I think it would be interesting to see uh, Asian Western, but in a Tarantino esque uh, kind of modernized way, even though it's set, you know, back in a certain period. Because my um, my grandfather, my mom's dad, actually worked um, on the railroad here in Canada. And oh, cool. even though they got paid, it was pretty much slave labor. And um, the story went that my grandpa and all these guys used to carry knives in their on their person because it would it wouldn't be that uncommon for the white man to like rope you and then drag you by a horse so you needed the knife to cut yourself free um so there's a lot of kind of juicy stuff in in that whole era that i would be interested in perhaps one day uh writing and directing and kind of working on a project is that the same, like that. Yeah. yeah is that the same history where it goes all the way through down to like utah and like um that whole entire railroad uh, in the United States as well, or is that like a separate? Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking the mm -hmm. the kind of through the Rockies type thing. Um, yeah, yeah, the Canadian Railway, but uh, yeah, because that's the thing that kind of led to like the like the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? It was um, yeah. The so they had to pay a head tax of I think it was five hundred dollars, which was a lot of money back yeah. then, um, and then the government you know, in more recent years, apologized for that. They issued yeah. an apology like, oh, we're sorry. That was like super racist of us. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just think. Uh, no, that would be yeah, huge. That, that like, would be. Yeah. That's yeah, a ten, that's a 10 episode, 10 season series run, you know, of that whole thing, because it's the only sorry, I don't I'm not trying to like high horse. Chinese people, but we're the only race that's ever been like literally legally excluded from the United States. Like there's never been an African exclusion act or, a, uh, or anything like that. It, it's only, sorry. And it's not a competition, but yeah, it's kind oh, of a yeah. weird fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's um, something that we used to talk about a lot in Chinese school when we were growing really? up. Really? Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah, some really, um, really fascinating and powerful documentaries that have been made. Yeah. Um, and so, so anyway, if you are going to make it, I will support you in that, and I will <laughs> throw you any resources and and you know, yeah. um, and help in, in that kind of that mm -hmm. kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, the um, the last question I have, because I know we're running slightly over. Sorry, Frank, I, I know you got to head out as well. Oh no, no, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, yeah, just you, real quick, I'll say. Um, you guys should check out Warrior if you haven't seen it. It does touch on some of these some oh, yeah. of these things you're talking about. Um, I heard the it's... railroad building and the politics yeah. of that and uh, the Exclusion Act, all that in you know San Francisco Chinatown in the 1800s is kind of in the backdrop of um of, of a martial arts epic. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, awesome yeah. show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Definitely has some of these elements. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, not all. And, and like, I love that. That that's where Asian stereotypes like really, like, I love that kind of side of you know the martial arts and and everything else. Um, okay, so the this is a quick one. We have a tradition at the companion where we ask guests to ask the next guest um, a question without knowing who they are. Um, <gasps> <laughs> you okay, Simone, you okay? You okay? Uh, I just lost you guys because I was looking at something because uh, I was trying to turn off my notifications and then now I've lost you. Oh. I can't see you. Can you see me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're, oh, you nothing okay. has changed. <laughs> nothing has changed. Okay, okay. Because your... I cannot see you at all. I'm just staring at yeah my screen. <laughs> uh, what was the question? Pardon me? 
Uh, so we have this tradition where wow. we always ask um, the guests to ask the next guest, but they don't know who they are, a question. So we have that up, and I hope you both will be willing to continue this tradition. So we'll play a little video, and it'll be a guest from the last um, guest that we had. And then afterwards, I'll ask you to hopefully pay that forward to our next guest, if, if that's all right. OK. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll have Franklin answer first. And then that way, Simone, you could either find our screen. And then no, I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Oh, you're back. OK. Yeah, good, good, and, and be able to yeah. think about it. All right, Rebecca, um, throw on throw on the question, please. Let's also bring it back to when we were talking about legacy earlier mm. and, and being remembered. So my question would be, if there's anything that you can contribute, anything you can contribute to this lifetime and where we're at right now, what would that, what would that be to you? What would it mean to you? Well, that's a big question. That's Frank. a Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's Anything beautiful. to contribute. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that is pretty big. Uh, I will say in general, I'm like, uh, not to try and sound like too Gen Z, but like good vibes kind of, you know, mm. um, just try to spread the good vibes uh, day to day and as a whole. Um, um, you know, and I guess that does tie back to uh, our conversation here, you know, kind of being entrenched in different cultures and spreading these voices uh, and experiences um, will help do that. Will help spread the good vibes. Oh, wonderful, yeah. um, Simone! I love that. It's so beautiful. Um, they say that the way to achieve immortality is to teach your teachings, share your teachings with the world. Because through that, your knowledge gets passed on. If you think about your life, there's certain things that people have said to you that you like held on to that advice or that way of doing things or whatever. And it just becomes your, your standard or your norm or your value. Um, so for me, I personally like to be a muse for people. I feel like I have been to a, a number of people. And I, I also want to uh, share positivity and, and represent. And um, for me, like I'm constantly like, it's funny, I'm always like nervous and scared, but I do stuff anyway. And I hope that I can always um, empower and uh, encourage others yeah to do the same oh that's great yeah yeah and, and maybe teach them some stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah. make the world a better place you know make them laugh yeah. yeah yeah okay well franklin can you can you ask our next guest a, a burning question that you've always wanted to have answered yeah, um, I don't. I don't have anything uh, grand or, or anything like that. But um, hopefully, this will like bring bring up something nice. But just what is the last thing you watched, read, listened to, anything like that? That um, yeah, really got you thinking. Uh, that you really enjoyed for whatever reason, uh, and yeah, just elaborate on that. Oh, thanks. And Simone, do you have a question for a future guest? Mm -hmm. My question for you is, what do you think the purpose of life is for you? Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to have to tee them up slowly on that. <laughs> <So here's> the <laughs> <first>. <laughs> nice. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, well, thank you. Uh, both Simone and Franklin for continuing this conversation um, on elevating Asian voices in television and in media. Um, and I want to really thank all of the people who showed up and all of our members or any of the members who are listening to this afterwards, you know, to, to allow us to kind of share our thoughts. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, 
if um, I'm going to do a couple of um, announcements to the to the members as well, so you two can kind of chill out and, and hang out, but you can also applaud or you know get pumped about what you know I'm about to talk about. So anyway, if anyone is new to the companion, uh, I just wanted to let all of you know that each year we try to take on one big project or two. And this year we're co-writing and co-creating a book with um, actress and director Amanda Tapping. Um, she was most famous for playing Sam Carter in the Stargate franchise, which I think a lot of the members here will know about. And the book, yeah, Rebecca, <laughs> we need the applause. We need the applause sound. <laughs> there it is. We got um, yeah, and the book is called Embracing Mental Health as a Fandom, um, which is also uh, the name of the event series and live streams that we do. So it's an extension um, where we will share stories and tools and strategies all around mental health, self-confidence, and personal development. Um, we have a couple of things to show you actually on that. Um, we started working with another, not another, uh, with one of my friends, uh, a designer, his name is Benio. And uh, yes, you should go to amandatappingbook.org. Very easy to sign up. It's absolutely free. And then you can kind of follow the journey. Uh, this is what the website is. It kind of tells you a little bit more about it. Uh, and just put your name and email in there. And then you're just going to get wonderful messages from me or Rebecca every every week, I guess. Um, but uh, Rebecca, yeah, can we get to a couple of the slides where we show people like early designs. Um, so one theme that we have, we have five th working themes at the moment, but this is probably the leading one. Um, and it's also the one that Amanda um, likes the most um, so far. Um, and it's called Universally Together. It's this kind of idea that, you know, we can all sometimes feel very lonely. Um, you know, we almost feel like individual stars, I guess, in, in the universe. But when we look up from Earth, we see constellations and actually we see really beautiful images and we see things that actually were more connected because anyone on earth looking up is always going to you know be able to see the same kind of stars um i guess scientifically it depends on if you're in the northern or southern hemisphere but anyway <laughs> that's why that's the concept and so yeah we had this kind of idea of allowing people to have thread and be able to kind of put together their own kind of collective journey i guess um and making sure people understand hey you're not you're not alone um and so yeah this is kind of one of the first uh, early designs it's more of like a mood board at the moment than rather the, the you know final design we're still working on it but yeah these are some of the um the kind of concepts and then i think the next page um we'll be able to show is um you know hopefully we'll be able to almost like bind the book together uh, with thread, with string, and again, it's symbolism for us all being connected, you know, through this kind of thread of life and, and the universe. So anyway, that is universally together. That's the theme, and I think that's kind of the leading one that we'll be playing with next week. Um, so you'll be getting these kind of updates if you sign up at amandatappingbook.org. Uh, we kind of explain some of these things in detail. Um, Frank, I'm going to you know, rely on you on buying a couple of copies of this book too, you know, to support the campaign you're in. <laughs> Simone, I won't, I won't make you have to buy one, but you certainly can if you like. <laughs> I'm kidding. It looks um, great. It looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited by it. Um, and for anyone else who wants to kind of uh, join the campaign, um, go to that website as well. We kind of explain there's a couple of other things that you could do. We have some super fun challenges. They're absolutely free. Uh, we've got a fitness challenge, a gate to gate challenge, basically the distance between Cheyenne mountain in Colorado. So kind of close to Franklin, actually, uh, there's a stargate. And in that world, all the way down, um, at the ancient outpost in Antarctica, there is another stargate. There's two stargates on earth, um, as you all know, and it's about 8,802 miles apart. And so as an entire companion fandom group, we are all going to walk, run, fly, ride a horse, alpine ski, whatever it is, we're going to like collectively make our way uh, for 8,802 um, miles, basically. And I think we're actually already 500 kind of miles in. So we need as like, you know, as much help as possible. I'm certainly upping my, you know, walks every single day. Um, so it's just really fun. And, you know, fitness is a huge part of mental health.
Mm -hmm. um, and then the other challenge that we have, if you're uh, not able to, you know, be physically involved, is um, uh, we have a 60 for 60 challenge, which is a Stargate watch along. We're watching 60 episodes of Stargate in 60 days. Don't worry if you can't watch it every single day. You can batch watch them or just join the conversation. And again, uh, every single day I pose a question um, around self-confidence or mental health or something like that uh, relating to the episode. So it's just kind of a fun thing to, to watch um, and talk about because, you know, Stargate didn't have social media when it was on back then. And so you couldn't really have these kind of global conversations. So that's another way you can kind of join in. Um, and then... Uh, really happy to announce that in two weeks' time, on April 6th, uh, I'll be hosting a masterclass with, um, with Brad, uh, the creator of the Stargate television series and also the creator of, of Travelers on Netflix. Uh, and it'll be around how to recharge your creativity. Uh, and it'll be a live stream, kind of like this one. Um, and it's been a conversation that I've wanted to have with Brad for over three years now. I've actually never interviewed him and had a conversation with them one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, in any of our events. So this will be the first one. Uh, so that's great. Okay, and finally, if any of you are attending Simone's uh, yoga class, hopefully, Simone, you have enough energy on the two hours. <laughs> uh, you will bring peace and mind and, and energy. Um, you can join that at the link uh, below. And then if you wanted to join myself for a conversation to continue elevating various voices and effectively a social hour, um, it's literally in the description below. I know the link says like amandatappingbook.org uh, slash get social. The link will get you there. Um, but if you, yeah, so I hope you join us and if you can just give us five minutes to set up and for us to get some water and use the restroom and all that kind of stuff, uh, we'll be there shortly. So just click that link and, and just hold tight. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll be able to get in. And for everyone else who's not able to join, um, thank you so much and see you next time. And thank you, Franklin and, and Simone. Yay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to end these things usually. I think Rebecca should hit the crowd noise again in celebration and then some kind of music. Faith. We don't say goodbye, we say so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and